Good morning, friends. I am so excited and grateful that we can use technology today to connect, reunite, and rejoice together in this special conference for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, serving the communities of Chico, Paradise, Magadia, Hamilton City, Durham, Willows, and my hometown of Orland, California. 
We welcome the many members of the church that are participating in this conference by way of social live media feeds, such as YouTube and Facebook, plus local TV station, Butte Community Access Center, and Spanish radio stations, KEGE 101.7 and KTOR 99.7. We particularly welcome those that are joining us for the first time, and I wish to personally express my faith united with yours that we might together rejoice in worshiping our loving Father in heaven and fulfill the measure of our creation as sisters and brothers. Presiding at today's conference is Elder Paul H. Watkins, an Area 70, who has been instrumental in serving our community during these past several years. He is a friend, and I express my deepest gratitude for his kindness and teachings. We are also joined today with the company of President and Sister Olson, who serve at and lead at the Sacramento Temple. Additionally, we welcome to our community President and Sister Tally, who serve and lead the missionary effort in our part of the vineyard and have been called to voluntary service for several years, leaving their home and families from Akron, Ohio. Thank you to all those who have made this event possible. If you wish to have a live chat conversation during this conference, please feel free to visit website www.connecting to the number two Christ.org. We will begin this conference by enjoying the hymn, I Know That My Savior Loves Me, followed by an opening prayer offered by Hannah Nelson. Then we will hear a special musical number, It Is Well With My Soul, that many here today will recall was sung at our conference of January 2019, when President and Sister Nelson visited our community and asked, that this particular song be performed by our choir with the inclusion of a verse that Sister Nelson added. A long time ago in a beautiful place children were gathered round Jesus he blessed and taught as they felt of his love Each saw the tears on his face The love that he felt for his little ones I know he feels for me I did not touch him or sit on his knee Yet Jesus is real to me
Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this state conference, the technology that makes it possible. We're grateful to be able to gather as saints in thy name and pray that we might have thy spirit to be with us, that we will have open hearts and open minds to listen to what thou wouldst have us learn. Um, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. beautiful song, It Is Well With My Soul, was composed by Philip Paul Bliss with lyrics by Horatio G. Spafford, who knew something about life's 
unexpected challenges. Perhaps we cannot always say that everything is well in all aspects of our lives. There will always be storms to face, and sometimes there will be tragedies. But with faith in a loving God and with trust in His divine help, we can confidently say, It is well, it is well with my soul. Next, we will have the opportunity to hear from Sister Turner, followed by Sister Velasco, and then Brother Bean. I think the year 2020 is one we will never forget. With fires and other natural disasters, political and civil unrest, <clears throat> and the health and economic effects of a pandemic, it has been a challenging year. Some wonder if God is aware of our situation, if he actually hears and answers our prayers. I would like to share some experiences that have reaffirmed my conviction that God is mindful of us, always. We are his children, and he knows and loves us each completely. So even in 2020, we can find hope and feel joy. Three years ago, in July of 2017, while teaching in the police academy at Butte College, I had a cardiac arrest. Thanks to the heroic efforts of the paramedics in the room, <clears throat> health professionals and medical equipment in the building, my heart was still beating when the ambulance arrived. I was in a coma when my husband and daughter got to the hospital. They called family members and invited their faith in prayers. And that evening with children on the phone joining in prayer, I opened my eyes. My first recollection was <clears throat> waking up in a hospital room and seeing our oldest son Cameron standing by the window. He lived 2,000 miles away and had been estranged from most of the family for over a year. I was so grateful to see him there and thought to myself, whatever just happened was so worth it. A week later, I went home from the hospital. Cameron worked remotely and stayed up for a month to help. It was an answer to prayer. I don't think God caused my cardiac arrest, but his tender mercies around that event brought our family together. The following year, 2018, we welcomed Cameron back to California for a job in, in Sacramento. And then in November, 20, two years ago today, our home, our daughter's home, and my husband's office were lost to the campfire. It hasn't been easy, but as we joined with others of faith, we were blessed with courage and hope. We were humbled by the support we felt from extended family and from so many others, and we felt God's care and love for us. When we went to our lot after the debris had been removed, there in the gaping hole that had been our home was a big patch of white alyssum, flower starts that my mother gave to everyone. I looked heavenward and thanked her for the love note. 2019 was a year of family gatherings. We were happy to spend more time with Cameron and his children as they connected with, with cousins, aunts, and uncles. There was camping and river rafting, there were birthday celebration, Thanksgiving, and the annual Christmas tree cutting event that Cameron led with gusto. 17 days later, on a run after work, he collapsed. Efforts to resusc resuscitate him were unsuccessful, and Cameron returned home to God who gave him life. Our family grieved. We aren't complete without him but we're so grateful for the time that we had together and for the memories from the previous year and a half. We found comfort in the warm welcome we know Cameron received from his grandparents, and we feel peace in God's timing. We look forward to a wonderful reunion when our time on earth is done. This fall, our daughter-in-law requested family his history information for an immigration unit that she was teaching at home. As I researched and sent pictures of our ancestors, read their histories and told their stories to our grandson, I felt a deep connection to family, both here on earth and those who have passed on. We are eternal beings. We came from heaven as spirit children of God and are on our way back home to be with him and our loved ones. If I sum up the last three and a half years as a cardiac arrest, a fire, the death of our son, and a pandemic, life sounds terrible, but it hasn't been. We have stronger connections to our family and to God and hope for the future. 
Your experiences are different from mine, but God's promises are the same. As we draw close to him, as we pray and study, as we love and serve, we can find hope and feel joy. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ, who makes this all possible. Amen. ¿Cómo mantenernos conectados a Dios y al Evangelio de Jesucristo? Uh, para mí es mediante la oración. Uh, Jesús enseñó, por tanto, siempre debéis orar al Padre en mi nombre. La oración es una de las mayores bendiciones que tenemos mientras estamos sobre la tierra. Por medio de ella podemos comunicarnos con nuestro Padre Celestial y buscar su guía mediante la oración. Es un, la oración es un diálogo franco y sincero con nuestro Padre Celestial. Debemos orar a Dios y a nadie más. No debemos orar a ningún otro ser ni cosa hecha por la mano del hombre o de Dios. Hermanos, yo tengo un testimonio uh, muy bonito que sé que nuestro Dios, nuestro Padre Celestial vive uh, y su Hijo Jesucristo vive y que nos, que nos aman. Por, porque tenemos todas las herramientas para seguir en su evangelio, la restauración de, de su iglesia al tener un profeta viviente y apóstoles, misioneros, que yo adoro los misioneros sin ellos, uh, yo no, uh, no estaría aquí con esta grande fe que, que tengo en el momento. El libro de Mormón tenemos, gracias al profeta José Smith, podemos llegar hasta el final, como dice en Doctrinas y Convenios. Sé fiel hasta el final, y he aquí estoy contigo. Estas palabras no son del hombre ni de hombres, sino mías, dice Jesús. Es, dice Jesucristo que... Tu Redentor por la voluntad del Padre. Amen. Hello, my name is Taylor Bean. How do my family and I stay connected to God during the COVID pandemic and other challenges? Today, I will review two gospel principles with you that help my family and me stay connected to Him. Number one is scripture study. Number two is prayer. By reading from the scriptures, we learn about the relationship between God and his children. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11, Jesus says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. The sermon continues. Or what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he, get, will he give him a stone? In other words, would a parent give his or her son a rock if the child asked for food? The verses continue. Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a scorpion? In other words, would a parent give a, give a snake to his or her son that asked for a fish? The sermon continues. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? In other words, parents would not give their children rocks or snakes when they ask for food, and God knows even better than parents do about what to give his children. These verses highlight that God is our Father, that he knows what is best for us, and is eager to bless us with it. I am thankful for the scriptures and that they teach us about our relationship with God and how to connect with him and claim his blessings. The previously mentioned verses teach about asking things of God, so how do we pray? Number one, we address God. Number two, we thank him for blessings that we have. Number three, we ask him for blessings that we would like to have according to his will. 
And number four, we close in the name of Jesus Christ. A few years ago when I was attending college, I was in my sophomore year and was undecided about my field of study. I didn't want to waste time and money taking classes that would not contribute to my eventual major. I had done many things to try and determine a field of study, including praying, meeting with an academic counselor, taking a class that discussed different options about careers, doing an internship, and speaking with family and friends. As I prayed one night, the Holy Ghost communicated a prompting to me from heaven. The message was to transfer to a different university. I was surprised and somewhat confused about the guidance. Shortly after this, based upon feedback from my internship and some other previous discussions, my academic counselor suggested a field of study and said that it was offered at the university that I had received the prompting about. It was not offered at the university that I was attending. While I was nervous and unsure about leaving friends, a job, and other familiarities, the prompting from heaven then made sense and felt right. I rejoiced and knew that God had guided me and answered my prayer. I took the leap of faith and transferred to that university. This ultimately led me to a field of study that I really enjoyed and graduated in, another internship opportunity that allowed me to meet my wife, and a job here in Chico. As we read God's word and converse with him through prayer, he is eager to bless us with his deep love and individually tailored guidance as we confront the challenges of life. From this experience with prayer and many others, I know that God and his son, Jesus Christ, care for, love, and guide each of us individually. This love and care are so deep that God gave his only begotten son, and Jesus paid the exquisite price for our sins and the ability to be resurrected. I testify of these wonderful truths in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I am so grateful to Sister Velasco and Brother Bean for talking about prayer. And as Sister Turner shared those several and powerful personal experiences, some related to the devastating fires in and around the Paradise areas that happened exactly two years ago today. I am reminded on how frequently I've heard people share their reliance on prayer as a means to obtain peace and instruction from our loving Father in Heaven. Thank you for sharing. Next, we've invited two of our full-time missionaries who have moved to our area and are serving to help us learn more about how to connect with God and to enjoy the blessings of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Sister Peterson and Sister Price will address us. They will be followed by a special musical number, Near My God to Thee. President and Sister Olson, who serve at the Sacramento Temple, will share a message from the grounds of that beautiful temple. We love them and appreciate them so very much. They will be followed by President and Sister Tally, who lead the mission in our area. Then I want to share with all those participating in this conference today a pre-recorded message from President Russell M. Nelson about a proclamation to the world released in April earlier this year. It has been a source of inspiration to many, and I hope you feel and appreciate the spirit and life-informing doctrine taught therein. Hi, I'm Sister Peterson, and I'm Sister Price, and we're two of the missionaries in the Butte and Glen Counties area. And we wanted to share today some experiences where we have felt connected to God and how those experiences and those connections have blessed our lives. Um, I wanted to start by saying some ways that I know that I have felt connected to God. I can feel Him as I pray and study the scriptures, the words of His words, and as I get to know Him better and learn more about Him. I also have a cool experience where I've prayed and I've felt His love for me and I felt connected to Him. I One time I had a really big question on my mind and I, I didn't really know what to do about it and how to get an answer, but as I prayed, I, I knew that God was aware of me and that He was going to help me and give me the answers that I needed. And that connection came immediately and I felt that He was there for me and that He knew who I was and that He was going to help me um, to overcome these difficult things that, that would be happening in my life. And, 
the difficult things that happen in our lives as we as we live every single day. I know that I've seen these blessings as well and that God loves us and is mindful of us and is aware of us. He's so aware of us that he has a plan for us. Um, I know I kind of had a plan for how I wanted this year to go and it did not turn out like how I thought. But God's plan is always greater than ours and his timing is always greater than ours. And I have really felt that this year because I this year turned out better than I thought, all things considered. And so um, I know that God loves us so much. He loves all of his children and he will um, help us if we ask, if we reach out to him and try to connect with him through prayer, through scripture study, through attending church. I know that God knows each of us. He knows who we are and where we are and he wants to help us. There are evidences of his love everywhere in our lives and we just need to see them. So as we do things that can help build up our faith and help us to feel more connected to him, we will see his hand more in our lives and we'll be able to have those blessings more as well. And I know these things to be true and I know that God loves each of us so much. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, friends and family, I'm David Olson. This is my wife, Gail Olson. We're the president and matron of the Sacramento Temple here in Sacramento, California. 
Today we want to talk to you about temples and family. The Sacramento Temple was dedicated in 2006, and we've had the honor to serve here for the past two years. Enough of that right now. Let's hear what my wife has to say about our meeting and our, and our marriage. We both grew up in Springville, Utah. Um, I met David after his mission, and uh, we got engaged and were married on January 2nd, 1973. It was colder than cold, and we decided that we wanted to be um, married in the Manti Temple because our dad and mom, our, both of our parents had been married in the Manti Temple. Well, it was even colder at the Manti Temple than it was in Springville. It was 12 below zero, and, and we had car doors freezing shut. We, we just had all kinds of interesting experiences that morning, but we were so full of happiness and joy when we walked out. Of yeah, the, it was, it was cold, but we are frozen. To get, we are together <laughs> even after these almost 48 years now, and we're so happy. <laughs> Let's talk about temples just a little bit. At the time we were married, there were 15 dedicated temples in the world. Currently, there are 168 dedicated temples in the world. Additionally, there are 24 more that have are under construction and another 39 that have been announced. Some of the most recent announcements of temples include temples in the United Arab Emirates, Nigeria, Pennsylvania, Brazil, the island nation of Kiribati. Temples dot the earth. Why do we build temples? Well, we understand from the proclamation given by the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles that they proclaimed that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. The children have the right to be born within the bonds of matrimony and to be reared by a father and mother who honor marital vows with complete fidelity. Temples have been around for since ancient times. We know in the Old Testament we read of Solomon's temple. There was the Ark of the Covenant as well. The children of Israel had a sacred um, Ark of the Covenant, which the Lord gave specific instructions to them how to build a tabernacle around. And that was something that they erected as soon as they, they stopped in a place and were, uh, were settled, they, they got their, it, it was the form of, a, of their temple. Now, in the Savior's time, in the New Testament time, we had Herod's temple. That's the temple where we find Jesus as a youth teaching of the people who are there in the temple. He was also in that temple later during his ministry. That temple was important at that time. Now, during the Savior's ministry here on the earth, he additionally did something that some people overlook. In Matthew 16, as recorded, he states to his apostles, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is what we refer to as the sealing authority. This is the authority that allows families, yours, mine, and all the peoples of the earth to be bound together. Not only the families we have right now, but our generational families as we come to understand and know them. There's a quote by President Monson, and it, it voices some, some of the yearnings of our hearts because we love our families, we look forward to heaven. He said, the temple prepares all who enter there to return homeward, homeward to heaven, homeward to family, and homeward to God. We testify the sealing power has been restored to the earth. We read in the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. This prophet Elijah appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith in the Kirtland Temple on April 3rd, 1836, and fulfillment of prophecy and the keys and the power, the, the keys the, and for the ability to perform sealings here on earth was once again restored to the earth. This authority allows our families to be sealed together. It underline, underscores the importance of us doing our genealogy that we might find our ancestors and be able to bind them to us as we are to them through eternity. Family history is, is marvelous and fun. I have found great joy in looking through diaries and histories of my ancestors. In fact, sometimes I have made what we call 
grandpa's quizzes so that um, the, our grandchildren can try to understand who their ancestors were and who had what horse, etc. We uh, want them to know uh, that that the people who went before them aren't just names and dates, that they have experiences and things that uh, things that they loved and didn't love, and we want them to know as much about them as possible. Recorded histories are also important. My grandson Max wrote and asked for the recorded history I had from my father so that he could listen to his great-grandfather's voice telling the stories of his youth. Gail has a story of her family. I'll tell you the story of a young man who um, who thought he had, well, he had his future planned. He went to college, became an electrical engineer. At the This was at the beginning of the, the 20th century, which uh, was unique for that time. He and his friend um, married sisters and both of them were electrical engineers and they moved to Chicago to work for Westinghouse. They, uh, this young man and his wife had a little girl and then three years later they had a little boy and uh, she a week later she had complications from pregnancy and passed away she this young mother died and left the young man we're talking about just bereft he was only 27 years old he had the job of a lifetime but and he had a three-year-old and a brand new baby to take care of he, his best friend, who he'd gone to Chicago with, um, had been listening to some missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And he thought that this uh, young man, Henry, would be interested in their uh, message because they were telling, they were saying that they believed that families were together for, could be together forever and that there was the sealing power had been restored to the earth. Henry was very interested in this because he loved his wife and he wanted his children and his wife to be together even after, after this mortal life ended. And so after uh, about a year and a half, he decided that he would join the church. He enlisted the help of a friend uh, who had been um, a sister missionary and she stood in for his deceased wife and he and she were sealed together and the little girl who was then five and her baby brother who was two were also in the temple and were sealed to their mother and father forever. The rest of the story is that the, that young woman, woman who had been a sister missionary married this young man about a year and a half later and she was the grandmother that I knew. I guess you could tell that that little girl was my mother. And I am so grateful that my grandfather was interested and found the church. It's blessed our family so much. I'm grateful. And now my, my mom and dad have passed away fairly recently, and I do miss them so much. And but I, my testimony of the temple is that I know that I'm going to be able to be sealed, that I am sealed with them for time and eternity, that we'll have the familial relationships. They'll be my mom and dad after this life and I will be their daughter and I'll get to hug my mom as my mom and my dad as my dad. And that's my testimony of the, of the temple. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, we find great joy in serving in the house of the Lord. It brings us joy to see the joy on individuals' faces as they are sealed together, as they are bound together as husband and wife, as parents and children. We testify to you that families can be and truly are forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Good morning. We are Brother Talley and Sister Talley from Akron, Ohio. We are currently serving a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Northern California. Our message is a simple one, that the church that Jesus Christ established anciently has been restored in its fullness through modern day prophets and apostles. Through this restoration, we have both been able to connect more fully with God, our eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. 
Brother Tally and I are both converts to the church. I joined at the age of 13. I was born into a family that attended the Methodist church, but stopped attending when I was just a small girl. I then attended an all-girls Catholic school, which provided a good religious foundation. I enjoyed attending mass with my classmates and loved hearing the stories of Jesus. However, when I first met, first met with the missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I was taught principles I had always believed, but had never found in other churches. I joined at the age of 22, after I had graduated from college. I was raised in the Episcopal faith, but when I was a senior in high school, I found that I no longer believed the tenets of that religion, particularly the tenets of a God without a body, parts, or passions. When I first met with the missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they taught me of the prophet Joseph Smith, they told me that in the year 1820, when Joseph was a young boy of 14, living in New York, he tried to understand which of the various Christian churches he should join. The Bible, in Ephesians 4, 5, taught that there was one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Joseph attended various church meetings, as I had just before I met with the missionaries, but remained confused, Joseph remained confused, about what, the, what church to join. As he sought for truth one day, he was reading in the Bible, James 1, 5, which reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally. Joseph decided to ask God directly and to find out what church to join. He went into a woods to pray, and as he did, he had an amazing spiritual experience. He said this, he said, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description standing above me in the air. One of them spoke unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Joseph was visited by God our eternal Father, and his Son, Jesus Christ. The Savior told Joseph not to join any of the churches. Instead, Christ said he would reestablish his church through Joseph as it existed anciently. For me, Joseph's experience answered so many of the questions I had. I learned that God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, were separate beings. When I prayed, even as a child, I envisioned God this way. This was a God I could understand and build a relationship with. The gospel has been restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. Because of that first vision, I have been able to build a strong and enduring relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ. My conversion experience centered on asking myself the question, is there a God? In 1976, during my senior year in college, I began to ask myself that question often and to think about it deeply. To find an answer, I went to the Rocky Mountains after graduation, and there I did find an answer. One day, while working in a restaurant kitchen in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, I felt a quiet, authoritative voice tell me, there is a God. I felt enlightened but I didn't know what to do next, so I called my twin brother. He was serving a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City. He received permission for me to visit, so I hitchhiked 300 miles from Jackson Hole to Salt Lake City to see him. Among other things, he took me to church for sacrament meeting and gave me a copy of the Book of Mormon. On my return to Jackson Hole, I had already read 150 pages and as I read, I felt that quiet, authoritative voice again speaking, this time with powerful clarity. In the book, Mosiah chapter 2, verse 48, it reads, Oh, remember, remember that these things are true, for the Lord God hath spoken it. I was enlightened again. There was a God, and he had spoken to me from the Book of Mormon. I decided then and there to join the church. A few weeks, a few weeks later, I returned home to Ohio and invited the missionaries to my house. When we met at the doorstep, I said, elders, I want to be baptized. 
A week later, I was baptized, and the Book of Mormon has guided my life ever since. What has the Book of Mormon done for me? Because of the Book of Mormon, I know there is a God, and that Jesus Christ is his beloved son who atoned for my sins. I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet, and that we have an unbroken chain of priesthood authority with modern prophets and apostles to guide our church today. Because of the Book of Mormon, I'm a member of the church and have the promise of an eternal family with my wife and seven children. After my conversion, I served a mission for the church in Rome, Italy for two years. I met with and taught the restored gospel to hundreds of wonderful Italians, and in the process, further deepened my connection and my relationship with God. I too know that the Book of Mormon is a true record, a second witness of Jesus Christ that works hand in hand with the Bible, often explaining things in the Bible that are hard to understand. The Book of Mormon has been a rock because it has deepened my understanding of Jesus Christ and his atonement. He has suffered and died for the sins of the world, but especially for my sins. The Book of Mormon has guided my life through every doubt and every problem since I joined the church at the age of 13. Because of the Book of Mormon, I know that Joseph Smith was telling the truth when he said at the age of 14, he was visited by God the Father and Jesus Christ. This and subsequent revelations have corrected centuries of misunderstanding about the true nature of God and our relationship with him. And Joseph Smith remained a prophet to the end of his life. He sealed his mission as a prophet with his own blood, having been killed at the hands of a mob while incarcerated in a Missouri jail in 1844. I testify that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God that through him Jesus Christ restored his church on the earth. I testify that the church is still directed by prophets and apostles today. I testify that the Book of Mormon is the word of God, another testament of Jesus Christ. And I testify that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world and that he lives and will come in glory to reign on this earth. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Because of the Book of Mormon, and the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ, I am more intimately and deeply connected to God. I have a continuing relationship with Him, and He has directed me with personal revelation at crucial moments in my life to make correct decisions and to lead me to an enduring daily peace. I too know that Jesus Christ lives and that He is the Son of God and that He and His Father appeared to Joseph Smith to reestablish the Church as it existed anciently. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. On various occasions throughout the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have erected monuments to commemorate important anniversaries. On the Prophet Joseph Smith's 100th birthday in 1905, for example, President Joseph F. Smith dedicated a large obelisk at the Prophet's birthplace in Sharon, Vermont. On another significant centennial, July 24th, 1947, 100 years after the pioneers entered the Salt Lake Valley. President George Albert Smith dedicated the This is the Place Monument at the mouth of Emigration Canyon in Salt Lake City, Utah. As we anticipated the 200th anniversary of the first vision received by Joseph Smith, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles pondered what we might do to commemorate appropriately this unique event that initiated the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ and ushered in the dispensation of the fullness of times. We asked ourselves if another monument should be erected but as we considered that unique manifestation of revelation 
and the historic international impact of that first vision, we felt impressed to establish a monument of words, words of solemn and sacred proclamation written not to be carved in tables of stone, but in words that could be etched in the fleshy tables of all human hearts. During the 190 years since the church was organized, only five proclamations have been issued, with the last being the family, a proclamation to the world, presented by President Gordon B. Hinckley in 1995. Now, as we contemplate this significant time in the history of the world and the Lord's charge to accelerate the gathering of Israel in preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ, we, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, issue the following proclamation. Its title is, The Restoration of the Fullness of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, a Bicentennial Proclamation to the World. It is authored by the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It is dated April 2020. We solemnly proclaim that God loves his children in every nation of the world. God the Father has given us the divine birth, the incomparable life, and the infinite atoning sacrifice of his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. By the power of the Father, Jesus rose again and gained the victory over death. He is our Savior, our Exemplar, and our Redeemer. 200 years ago, on a beautiful spring morning in 1820, young Joseph Smith, seeking to know which church to join, went into the woods to pray near his home in upstate New York, USA. He had questions regarding the salvation of his soul and trusted that God would direct him. In humility, we declare that in answer to his prayer, God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ, appeared to Joseph and inaugurated the restitution of all things as foretold in the Bible. In this vision, he learned that following the death of the original apostles, Christ's New Testament church was lost from the earth. Joseph would be instrumental in its return. We affirm that under the direction of the Father and the Son, heavenly messengers came to instruct Joseph and reestablish the church of Jesus Christ. The resurrected John the Baptist restored the authority to baptize by immersion for the remission of sins. Three of the original 12 apostles, Peter, James, and John, restored the apostleship and keys of priesthood authority. Others came as well, including Elijah, who restored the authority to join families together forever in eternal relationships that transcend death. We further witness that Joseph Smith was given the gift and power of God to translate an ancient record, the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. Pages of this sacred text include an account of the personal ministry of Jesus Christ among people in the Western Hemisphere soon after his resurrection. It teaches of life's purpose and explains the doctrine of Christ, which is central to that purpose. As a companion scripture to the Bible, the Book of Mormon testifies that all human beings are sons and daughters of a loving Father in heaven, 
that he has a divine plan for our lives and that his son Jesus Christ speaks today as well as in days of old. We declare that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, organized on April 6th, 1830, is Christ's New Testament Church restored. This church is anchored in the perfect life of its chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and in his infinite atonement and literal resurrection. Jesus Christ has once again called apostles and has given them priesthood authority. He invites all of us to come unto him and his church to receive the Holy Ghost, the ordinances of salvation, and to gain enduring joy. 200 years have now elapsed since this restoration was initiated by God the Father and his beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Millions throughout the world have embraced a knowledge of these prophesied events. We gladly declare that the promised restoration goes forward through continuing revelation. The earth will never again be the same as God will gather together in one all things in Christ. With reverence and gratitude, we as his apostles invite all to know, as we do, that the heavens are open. We affirm that God is making known his will for his beloved sons and daughters. We testify that those who prayerfully study the message of the restoration and act in faith will be blessed to gain their own witness of its divinity and of its purpose to prepare the world for the promised second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I noted a few thoughts that I would like to share with you this morning. They are prompted by the message that we just heard about the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As some of you know, I grew up in a small town of Orland, California. As a boy, the population then was around 3,000 people. It had, as I recall it, a particular record of having the greatest number of churches and bars per capita than any other U.S. city. In my formative years, I had a steady and curious interest about God and was eager to discover if he was real, and if so, was there a place to go that represented him? Being that my mother is Mexican and was brought up in San Francisco, attending school taught by nuns, it was comfortable and easy to attend a little Catholic church located on A Street. As a typical and curious boy, at around the age of 12, and after attending church there for several years, I had a problem. I was concerned about the teaching that those unbaptized would end up going to a very unpleasant place after death. It really didn't seem fair to me. What about all those wonderful people across the world who would never have the chance for baptism? Would God really punish them? I set about to visit with the very kind father, the ecclesiastical leader of this beautiful Catholic church. I had two questions for him. The first was about where would I go if I decided not to be baptized? The second question I can save and share for another time. To this day, I don't recall what he said. I remember that he was kind, and I felt his love and concern for the grief that this question brought into the life of a young boy. But in the end, I decided to leave and chose never to return. After attending and trying to learn more from many other churches, I think the number was around 12, I finally decided to give up on the idea and elected to no longer believe in God. When, in my senior year of college, I came into contact with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I thought, okay, I will give this another try, but the results are inevitable. 
I'll end up just leaving it behind like all the others. What I did not expect was the following. One, the doctrine taught me was sound. It was logical. And most importantly, it felt like I was connecting to something. Two, I started feeling communication from heaven. And that felt like I was starting to connect with God. Three, I was taught that families exist together even after death. And that felt like I was starting to connect with those who have since passed away. Four, I quickly read the Book of Mormon, another companion to the Bible, and that provided information that connected me to prophets of old that had knowledge far beyond what I currently possessed. Five, I learned that there were persons currently living that humbly professed to be prophets, seers, and revelators. Persons that represented God, just like we find in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It wasn't long before I established a connection with God and chose to trust the feelings and communication he was kind enough to share with me. Now, 30 plus years later, I can, with full confidence and a measure of wonder, express the deepest gratitude to a kind and loving Heavenly Father for allowing me to make this spiritual journey. I love Him, and I love my personal Savior, Jesus Christ. Anything good that has happened in my life, I credit to God. Anything bad that has happened in my life, I credit God for helping me to grow from it. I feel connected to God. I feel connected to my Savior, Jesus Christ. I feel connected to the temple. I feel connected to specific family members who have since passed away. I feel connected to the prophetic words found in the Bible and the Book of Mormon. It was Christ's love for his quote, other sheep that brought him to the new world. From the Book of Mormon, we learn that great natural disasters and three days of darkness occurred in the new world following the death of the Lord in the old world. Then the glorified and resurrected Lord descended from heaven and ministered among the people of the new world. Quote, I am the light and the life of the world. He told them, Quote, and I have drunk out of that bitter cup which the Father hath given me, and have glorified the Father in taking upon me the sins of the world. Then he provided one of the most tender experiences anyone could have had with him. He invited them to feel the wounds in his side and the prints of the nails in his hands and feet, that they would know for certain that he is, quote, the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, and had been slain for the sins of the world. I have never felt the nail prints of the Savior. In my 55 years, I've never personally met him, but that hasn't deterred me from knowing who he is. My personal Redeemer and the light of the world that brings peace when there is conflict, brings clarity when there is confusion, brings joy when there is anger, brings love when there is hate. I feel connected to Jesus Christ. Lastly, I feel connected to President Russell M. Nelson, who I sustain as a modern prophet of God. I have personally met him. I have felt his genuine love and his prophetic words of affirmation. And I leave my testimony that I know God lives, that Jesus is the Christ, that the saving ordinances in the temple establish truth and offer the power and authority to heal personal wounds and bind families together forever. And I share that testimony with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Next, it will be our privilege to hear a message from Elder Paul Watkins. We will then conclude this conference by hearing the hymn, Consider the Lilies of the Field, and our closing prayer will be offered by Skylar Ramson. 
Thank you, President Meyer. I bring greetings this morning and love from President M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who sent me. I remember several years ago attending a conference like this in the Chico Steak with Elder Ballard. And I'm delighted to be back. And I wish with you that he could have been here too. President Meyer, thank you also for gathering your stake leaders and your ward leaders and your members to this meeting today. The good people in the city of Chico and the surrounding communities are blessed because of your service. Your testimony is clear and significant and reminds me again that your call was inspired. You have many talents, but an even greater capacity to love the people whom you serve. I understand that there are also joined uh, in this meeting many of your neighbors from many different faith traditions. We welcome you especially. We love you and we want to serve you and to bless you. We feel a responsibility to share with you our connection to the Savior, Jesus Christ, and his restored gospel. We pray for you as you search for truth on this holy Sabbath day. And to you who've spoken at this meeting this morning, thank you for your courage and your willingness to accept the opportunity to share your stories and testimonies about Heavenly Father and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sister Turner, Thank you for your personal witness and your story of why the scriptural phrase beauty for ashes has special meaning for you. This phrase has become a badge of courage among faithful people throughout the world, especially in paradise and the surrounding communities on this anniversary day. I especially enjoyed the children who sang for us before the meeting began. You did great. The song, I am a child of God, is a vital true doctrine and so important to know, especially when we are young. I'm so glad that Brother Bean spoke about the twin doctrines of scripture study and prayer. This marvelous combination readies our heart and our mind to receive revelation. As Sister Velasco taught, prayer is a frank and open conversation between a child and Father in Heaven. And again from Brother Taylor, because he knows what we need as we ask in faith, Heavenly Father will answer our prayer perfectly. I'm speaking to you this morning from my office in Cameron Park. The technology that allows me to be with you in your home today is staggering. I'd rather be in your home, actually, and not virtually. If I was there in your home, and after we exchanged greetings and pleasantries, I would ask you to tell me your family's story. I would ask about your parents and your grandparents, your brothers and your sisters. I'd want to learn how long your family lived in, has lived in the United States and what brought you ultimately to California. Then, if it felt right, I would gently and respectfully ask about your faith story. I'd like to learn about your earliest memories when you knew about God and how your faith in Him sustains you during good times and bad. I've learned this about the thousands of people I've met over many years with whom I've had these conversations. You all have a fascinating, beautiful, and important story to tell. And your story is sacred. And is so sacred and connected to you that you will take it with you someday when you leave this life. My story is fascinating and beautiful and important and sacred to me. When I think about my earliest memories, Heavenly Father is there. I can't shake him from any part of any story in my history. When I look up at the night sky like I did as a boy and still do, 
I still feel he's watching over me and that he loves me. Still today, I feel that he is with me. How about you? Is Heavenly Father in your story? When did your story begin and when will it end? For a few minutes this morning, I want to press against the borders of your story by asking a few questions that have perplexed poets and philosophers for ages. Number one, where did you come from? Two, why are you here? And three, where are you going after this life? William Shakespeare once wrote, all the world is a stage and we are mere actors on that stage. We come and go, each taking our turn. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints understand that by divine design, we are all living during act two of a three-act play. There was an act one, and there will be an act three. What we know best is what is happening now, and we are lost in the present. Before we came to earth, we lived with our Heavenly Father. Abraham saw a vision of our premortal life and was told that he was there. And he wrote this. Let me find it. And the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And among all these, there were many of the noble and great ones. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them. Thou wast chosen before thou wast born. Members of the church also know that our previous life has been veiled from us except for occasional glimpses that are revealed to some for reasons known only to God. The veil that separates Act 1 from Act 2 set up the perfect laboratory of mortality, a place where we can learn to live by faith, where we can test self-will against God's will. While here, we can awaken a quest to discover if there is more to life than what we can see with our natural eyes. Shakespeare's comment about taking our turn on the stage invites us to ask more questions. What is the plot of the play? Who is the hero? Who is the villain? Where is the director and where is the script? These questions are vital because while on stage, no one wants to misspeak or waste time or play the fool because we have a sense that the director is somewhere watching. Will we act in faith and find and follow truth during our few moments on the stage during Act Two? I testify with President and Sister Tally that early in the spring of 1820, our Heavenly Father came to the earth with His Son, Jesus Christ. We testify that the Holy Father commanded the young prophet to be, Joseph Smith, to pay attention to Jesus Christ, to hear Him. This singular and significant event restored to the earth once again in our day, during Act Two, the relationship between the Savior and His prophets. Prophets point to the hero and the plot. They preach of Christ. They preach repentance and invite us to connect to him by being baptized. They encourage us to study and follow the words written in the Holy Scriptures. In our time, the scripture that connects us to Christ, in addition to the Holy Bible, is the Book of Mormon, another witness of Jesus Christ. In a day when Jesus is demoted, as an expletive, and the Book of Mormon is acted as a satire on a stage, this great book is the tool of gathering and conversion and preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ, and is quietly revealing sophisticated interior consistency, great conceptual richness, 
and exciting connections to antiquity. And Christ is revealing himself to more and more of the world's outliers who study its pages and with that study become sure witnesses. With this morning's many witnesses, I had mine. I testify that Russell M. Nelson is a prophet. His proclamation that you heard today is precisely what prophets do. The people of the world either disobey, as in the days of Noah, or obey, like the people of Nineveh. Christ taught this from Luke chapter 6. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was a founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not he is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Digging deep requires effort, and really is not for the faint of heart. To gain knowledge of great worth requires extraordinary personal effort, and this is particularly true when our desire is to gain spiritual knowledge. With this extraordinary effort, someday you will enter a holy temple where the prophet's authorized agent will apply a welding link connecting the families in your story together. As President and Sister Olson taught a few minutes ago, holy temples are built to seal families together forever. All of the activity that happens in holy temples prepares us for act since the Earth's missionaries were sent out nearly 200 years ago, hundreds of thousands of missionaries have been sent into the world to preach repentance and to baptize converts. The delightful and beautiful sister missionaries, sisters Peterson and Price, whom you heard this morning, represent hundreds of missionaries in our area and tens of thousands of missionaries who are serving now throughout the world. About these missionaries, I like this fun verse from the book of Hebrews. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Your quest for truth will accelerate as you allow the missionaries to teach the gospel and testify about Christ. Millions of people have heard their message and have connected to Christ's church and are now found in almost every country throughout the world. The growth of the church of Christ is accelerated because it is inclusive. Here in the Book of Mormon, we read this. Referring to Jesus Christ, He doeth nothing, save it be plain unto the children of men. He inviteth them to come unto him, and partake of his goodness, and he denieth none that come unto him. Black and white, bond and free, male and female, and he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God both Jew and Gentile. The spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ is accelerated because it is the remedy for loneliness. The divine gift that comes to the follower of Christ immediately following baptism is the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost is the promise of a constant companion. Um, among many reasons, it grants each new member the enabling power to overcome 
the challenges that might otherwise distract them. I testify that your story will have a happy ending as you have faith in Christ, follow his prophets, study his word, and strive to become like him. Truthfully then, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints prepares us for Act 3 and is the Church of Happily Ever After. I testify that Christ lives and is in the details of his church, that he wants us to be in the details he wants to be in the details of our life. I pray we will all feel a greater desire to pursue greater truth. I also pray that each of us will be open to feel his spirit testify of truth when we find it. Finally, I pray that we will respond to our spiritual feeling and become changed for the better, for good. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this chance that we have had to be spiritually uplifted and enlightened at Stake Conference. We're grateful for the leadership of President Meyer and his counselors and for the revelation that they have received in these troubling times. We're grateful for all of those who spoke today, and we ask that we may not forget the principles that have been taught, and that we may apply those to our lives so that we may better ourselves. We ask for a blessing to be upon all of the medical staff and other personnel who are dealing with this pandemic, that they will stay safe, and we ask for a blessing to be upon the scientists and researchers who are developing treatment and vaccines, that they may be safe as well, and that they'll be guided and directed by the Spirit in in developing a, uh, a vaccine. We are grateful for thee and for the love that you have for each and every one of us individually. And we love thee and pray for these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah.